Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Stoic Salon, where we talk about life, love, work, play, the universe, and Stoicism. And today, this is a special edition of the Stoic Salon podcast because in the Stoic Salon, which is our group dedicated to reading and writing with the Stoics, we have gathered together as a community to work through this book. This is Massimo Pigliucci's and Gregory Lopez's great workbook called Live Like a Stoic. This is the UK edition. If you've got a copy of the USA edition, it probably is called A Handbook for New Stoics. So Sophia Kutlaki, one of our Stoic Salon members, invited us all to join her on a journey through this book. She decided to work through this book and invited us all to join her. Uh, It's a year-long experience. Uh, There are 52 exercises for cultivating a good life. And uh, we started in mid-January. Today, The authors, Massimo and Gregory, are joining us and a few of us will gather together in this Zoom room, which I'm sharing with all of you for the podcast, and we'll be asking questions from Massimo and Gregory and just some advice on how to work through the book. How does this book work? We have already uh, discovered that in week four of working through the activities, some of our comments are, are like, ooh, this thing really works or, oh, stoicism is sticky. Um, So there is a sense of stickiness and things working um, by virtue of following Massimo and Greg's uh, exercises. And so without any further ado, let me open up the room and welcome you all to the Stoic Salon and uh, a special welcome to Massimo and Greg and to Sophia Kutlaki, who is leading us on this year-long journey. If you are interested in joining us, I'll add a link somewhere in the show notes or somewhere below this video, and you can register and join us in the Stoic Salon, which lives online at any time, any time throughout the year. Just join us wherever you happen to be in the book or whether you're going to start the book in six months. Join us. We're going to be there for the whole year and beyond fate permitting, as Massimo says. All right, on that note, let me um start the conversation i hope you enjoy it and find it very very useful too welcome everyone to the stoic salon where sophia kudlaki one of our members has invited us to join her on a journey Mm -hmm. a year-long journey to work through this book live like a stoic if you're in the usa it's probably called a handbook for new stoics um and today in the room is um are the authors massimo Piducci and gregory lopez and so we have them for like 55 minutes to ask <laughs> questions so this is really exciting we're going to be meeting every month Um, for a monthly check-in as we work through this book for the year and uh, it's really great to have Massimo and Gregory here so we can ask those questions we are in week four at the moment if you haven't started no worries you can join in at any time now if you have any questions about what is going on here or why you're even in this zoom room then just send me an email later at the email address that I've just put in the chat box and I'll answer all your questions. If you don't know who's in the room, if you can't find the link, if you don't know where the Stoic Salon is, you can join in later. Just send me an email and I'll follow up in the next few days. We are on a year-long journey and we're going to drive dive rather or drive (laughs) right into it. (laughs) Um, This is how it's going to work, everyone. We've got the authors here for 50 minutes. If you have already submitted a question in the Google Doc, we've got it. And uh, Sophia and I will invite you to turn on the mic um, and uh, ask your question. If you're not here, we'll ask it um, for you. Please be as succinct as you can so we can get through as many questions as you can. And in the chat box, do feel free to use the chat comment, engage, ask other questions. We might not be able to get to them, but we can save the chat and use it for future discussions. Um, And without further ado, 
I'm going to um, not going to do any intros because we should all know who we are. <laughs> I'm going to pose the first question to Sophia Kutlaki, who's um, the one who's brought us all together. And then I'll ask an introductory question to Massimo and Gregory. At 10 minutes to the hour, I'm going to ask the final question and then hand over to Massimo and Greg just for final words and encouragement. And um, then we're going to invite you all, once we say goodbye to Massimo and Greg, we're going to invite you all to stay for some breakouts. We're going to just meet in smaller groups, have a chat, have a, you know, a deep breath, take a deep breath and get to know each other because we're going to be with each other for the next year. So first question goes to Sophia Kutlaki. And Sophia, I, I really just wanted to know from you, well, why? Why? What's your rationale? Why invite us to join you on this year-long journey? Why this book? And why do it together in the Stoic Salon community? Well, I, I um, read the How to Be a Stoic last April. And in true fashion, about a couple of weeks after I read it, I was back to my normal self. So I thought, well, this is not going to work. And like you say, Matt and Gregory and Massimo in the introduction, you know, stoicism or anything else, I suppose, is one part theory, nine part practice. So I'm very good with the theory, but I like the practice. So I thought, you know, well, when I came across the book that is laid out as a workbook, I thought, wow, wouldn't that be really good if I could get a really group, a really good group together and do it. And then in November, Catherine did the joyful, the 28 day joyful death contemplation. So somehow the pieces of the puzzle came together. And I said, wow, we've got that lovely community. Everybody's getting on so well together. Why don't we try there? So the rest is history. And the rest is history. Yeah. That sounds good. <laughs> In the Thank unfolding. you so much. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much for inviting us. I'm really excited um, to do this because I also engaged with the book when it first came out and I did it solo. But looking back, I realised that I did not get to the end. That's my confession. So um, Massimo and Greg, my question to you just to kick us off is when you were conceiving of this book, how did you imagine us to use it? Were we supposed to go solo or did you think that we'd work in groups? Um, do you know of others that are working in groups? That's the first part of the question. And the second part is what transformation should we expect at the end of a year of living like a stoic? So over to you both. And welcome. Okay, good questions. <laughs> well, first of all, thanks for having us. This this is this is fun and, and hopefully it will be useful to people. What we envisioned was actually not a single way to approach the thing. I mean, you could do the book solo. It's probably better if you do it at least the first time around in a group. That's why actually when the book that when the book came out, Greg and I set up a, a Facebook group for common practice. And actually that group has already gone twice through the entire uh, to the entire ex uh, set of exercises. I'll, I'll post a link in a minute um, as soon as Greg will start talking. And um, so you could do it solo, you could do it in a group, probably as Sophia was, talk was saying, you know, group efforts are better because you get accountability uh, out of the fact that now you make a commitment. You know, this is a general feature of human psychology. If if other people rely on you or you're on a group, then you're more likely to get through this thing. However, uh, we also uh, said in the beginning that you don't have to commit to 52 exercises, you know, a whole year of practice unless you're already, you know, positive that that's what you want to do if you go to the introduction you will see that there is kind of a cheat sheet sheet there where there are we, we suggest three exercises for each one of the three disciplines of epictetus three for desire three for action three for ascent and we say you know you can start with that that's only a nine week commitment uh, and then if you feel like this is doing something uh, then, then you might want to explore the other thing to keep in mind is that although the exercise have a specific uh, sequence and ideally I think they should be done in that sequence that sequence isn't, isn't that strict uh, broadly speaking uh, you do want to do the three disciplines in sequence and broadly speaking you want to go you don't want to jump too far within each one of the three groups because the exercises become more and more complex more and more difficult to do, not necessarily complex but difficult to do or challenging uh, but you can certainly start with one and then skip three or four and go on, depending on, on whether you already have in mind certain 
problems or certain issues that you want to specifically work on. For instance, there are several exercises about anger and anger, anger management. And if that's one of your major problems, then, then you might want to give priority to those. Uh, Greg, what, what do you think? Right. I think ideally, um, we kind of wrote the book with the uh, weak hope that people would work through the entire year. And um, that is because stoicism is ideally a lifelong practice. The fact that sages, people who have reached the pinnacle of stoicism, are either non-existent or very rare tells us that many of us will require lifelong practice in order to achieve it. And that actually speaks to your second question to some degree as to what we would expect out of people who get through the book, um, which um, I'm a terrible salesperson. So if I ever in a fit of madness, email one of you saying, I'll, I'd be great for your marketing team, say no to me. Um, <laughs> but I expect not much in terms of overall change. We think that there may be small changes and we actually have self quizzes before and after each section in order to gauge your progress. But my guess is that there's not going to be a whole lot of change in terms of passions and necessarily changing your life in terms of full life projects and stuff because that stuff takes time. What my hope is for the book is to kind of give people an idea, A, whether they think stoicism really is for them, and B, what practices work for them specifically. We wrote the book with the idea that there was no one-size-fits-all exercise that's going to work for everyone for several reasons, just naming two of those reasons. Firstly, different things work for different people. And secondly, different people have different strengths and weaknesses. And so if they want to focus on their weaknesses, that'll be a unique curriculum. And we actually give guided, guidance on how to create your own lifelong curriculum in the epilogue of the book. So I would hope that by the end of the book, people would actually go and have some idea of how to use exercises that would most benefit them for the rest of their lives. Not that there's going to be some kind of fundamental um, personality shift that will make you very close to sage-like. So mm -hmm. that was my hope for the book. I love that. That's hopeful. Um, we've already noticed, in, and we're in week four, I think both Sophia, Scott Bennett, and uh, potentially Mandy, I think it was you, uh, Sophia said this morning, oh, wow, this thing works. Scott Bennett just a few days ago said, oh, maybe this thing will stick. And Mandy's also had some breakthroughs as well. So we're getting there, aren't we, already in week four. But, uh, yeah, we definitely, it's a lifelong practice, absolutely. Um, Scott Bennett, who, who doesn't isn't in the room today, has a question about, um, again, the book. Since writing the book, what, if anything, has persisted as a daily practice for you both? individually or both. So you want to so go I, home first? Sure. Um, so mostly I have shifted a little bit in terms of two things. So the first is that my main, if you look into my mind and see what's going on on a daily basis, most of what I'm doing is what, uh, what I would call situational role ethics in the moment. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the main thrusts of the second discipline, the discipline of action, and one way to conceive of it is um, what's called role ethics. This was a major thrust of Epictetus that was put forth by the scholar and most well explicated by the scholar Brian Johnson um, in his book, The Role Ethics of Epictetus. Scholars are uh, excellent at research, not necessarily excellent at titles, um, but, uh, but it is straightforward at least. Um, so, and though it's an academic book, it's A, very readable and B, very practical. And so what I find myself using is seeing what situations I'm in during the day and then kind of taking it on the fly from there. And that's kind of a thing that takes a lot of practice and some kind of fundamental grounding in Stoic theory as well as practice in order to proceed. But there are at least three exercises from the book that I find myself using. Um, recently, um, cued by actually a Buddhist lecture I went to recently, I've been focusing on week 15 and impermanence, um, especially around desires and things I want, realizing that the sat feeling of satisfaction and kind of journaling and thinking about that, that the satisfaction I get from achieving anything I want will fade, plus the thing itself will fade, and kind of visualizing and or writing about that kind of stuff. The second one that kind of sticks for me is the focusing on other virtues, which I think is week 17, um, especially for people who I have may have annoyance with um, in order to kind of write about their good qualities or things that I still admire about them. And the third thing is um, something that's actually akin to what you're on right now, um, week four, which is kind of thinking um, about people's, uh, people's other perspective and to ask myself how, if I'm annoyed by somebody, how... I am actually like that in a lot of ways. So for instance, I was 
I found myself like not furious, but annoyed at um, somebody recently who I thought was jumping to conclusions very strongly. And uh, uh, I realized that I could reflect that kind of question on myself. It's like, I'm jumping to conclusions about their own internal state and that they have less knowledge than they do. Do I actually know that? And it's very interesting because I find like the, um, probably the slight majority of things I get annoyed about when dealing with other people um, actually are causing the annoyance in myself, the same presupposition. So this person jumps to conclusions, that's so annoying. Oh, I'm jumping to conclusions about this person. And using that kind of mental Aikido is something I've been using recently. Yeah, I, I, that. Um, I focused on now in a sort of a stable, a currently stable uh, practice, my currently stable practice focuses on five uh, things or f five, five exercises, uh, one of which actually is not in, in the book, or at least we don't talk much about it in the book. Um, the first, the thing that I do almost daily is the philosophical journaling. Um, I, as part of you know, knowing myself and, and <clears throat> sort of try to think critically and analytically about what I could do better, what I can learn from, from my experiences. So I do the philosophical journaling on a regular basis. I used to do it every single night. Now I do it a few times a week, but because you know, after years of practice, you don't necessarily need to do it every night. Um, so that's that's one stable practice for me. Uh, one that we don't talk much about in the book is I try to uh, keep in mind the four cardinal virtues: practical wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, and and use them kind of as a moral compass. So whenever I face some difficult decision or some difficult situation, I ask myself sometimes explicitly if I have the time, you know, so would, the, would this be the practically wise thing to do, the courageous thing to do, the just thing to do, and the temperate thing to do? And if the answer is no to any of those questions, then you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, that I find that particularly useful. The third thing that I focus on that it's part of my regular practice is the dichotomy of control. Uh, so, you know, especially the very first exercise in the book, I find very useful this notion of when I, when I face, a, again, a challenge or a difficult situation to either physically or at least mentally come up with these two columns uh, of, you know, what is up to me and what is not up to me. And I try to fill out those columns as much as possible. And then I focus my attention on the first column, what is up to me, and try to develop an attitude of equanimity and acceptance toward the second column, what is not up to me. So that's the third. Um, the fourth standard practice is I, I need, I keep working on, on um, uh, developing tentative as opposed to more or less sure judgments. I tend to be pretty, sure my own opinions so i have a uh, a tendency to slip into this is absolutely like this and i try to catch myself mindfully about this and i try actually to to uh, alter my own language and say no don't say this is it they say well it seems to me that this is likely the case etc you know that sort of thing i'm making a little bit of progress but um you know i still have work to do and then the final is which also have had difficulty in the past is to develop an attitude of charity toward other others uh meaning that you know unfortunately my job as a university professor and a popularizer of philosophical and scientific ideas, I ran across all sorts of wacky ideas and all sorts of people that tell me all sorts of bizarre things. And I try really hard not to dismiss them, not to say, hey, look at this idiot, uh, you know, or look at this stupid thing. It, there is no such a thing as a stupid thing or an, as an idiot, or at least not, not nobody wants to be, that, that would be the stoic to take that nobody on purpose wants to say silly things and so if they are then i try to adopt marcus Aurelius' suggestion either teach them or put up with them but don't don't dismiss them don't don't, don't make fun of them don't ridicule them so these are the five things that are i tend to uh focus on a regular basis because i think that those are the ones where i need to make more progress that's really helpful both of you i think we kind of look up to you both and want to know how apart from writing something like this, how, what, what you do in your daily life. So it's really, I think it's really important to, to hear that. I'm going to go over this video, everyone, and take some notes. But if you're already taking notes about these practices, it'd be great to share them later in the Stoke Salamand is like smiling. Okay. Um, 
Massimo and Gregory and everyone, we came up with two scenarios, which is um, the kind of like what would Massimo and Greg do scenarios. <laughs> Sophia, I think I'll read the first one and then I'll read the first one for, say, mm. Greg, and then, Sophia, you read the second one for um, uh, huh? Massimo. Okay, and I'll this put is it a, in the a chat. test of sagehood, uh, Greg. Yeah, so. exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay. Can't wait to fail. All right, so this is uh, Liz. I don't think Liz is not in the room because she has to work, but this is Liz. Uh, it's a bit long, but I'll just read it. It's in the chat. Um, so in two bits in the chat, I've copy pasted into two bits. So this is a scenario from Liz and Liz wants to know what would Massimo and Greg do? And, and Greg, I'll put this one to you and we'll do the next one to Massimo. So this happened to me at work this week. One of our bosses sent us a group of teachers an email in response to a request about teaching spaces. I won't go into the details. Suffice to say that his reply could at best be described as rude and at worst, downright contemptuous and everyone was very put out by it. However, I tried to put this week's stoic lesson into practice and think about what values he holds uh, that would make him behave like that. I didn't feel much sympathy for the values I came up with. He believes he's better than us, respect isn't important, power at any cost. Then I thought maybe he was bullied when he was younger and somehow learned that this is the way to make his way in the world. Eventually, my anger dissipated as I came to the conclusion that he is someone who is not in control of his anger or behaviour and that I certainly have no control over him. However, I was left with some nagging doubts. Was accepting his behaviour and moving on wise or a lack of courage? He's a bit, scared, a bit of a scary guy, so it's easier not to do anything. Did the bully get away with it? Should I or we have somehow taken a stand against his behaviour rather than excusing it? Isn't our anger sometimes useful in alerting us that someone isn't treating us the way they should? I think this can be a particular problem for women who often like to avoid conflict. Well, what would Massimo and Greg do? Or Greg, in this case, what would you do? So I guess the first question to address is the passion of anger or annoyance by um at the reaction to the email that the boss sent. And so um, in terms of kind of how Epictetus would frame things, um, remember that, and our, remember that the book follows at Epictetus's structure and it has two main phases. The first is the, what Pierre Hadot calls the discipline of desire and aversion, where you um, focus on trying to train yourself to quell your desires. And anger is classified as a desire in the Stoic framework, specifically a desire to punish or get at another person. And so this falls squarely into there. And the short answer, I guess, is I would first um, make sure that I can get a hold on the anger before acting out. Because if I kind of go forward and try to do something while angry, I may do something that's not calculated or unwise to do. That's, in fact, the main reason why the Stoics wanted to eliminate the passions, not because they feel bad. In fact, many passions feel good, in a sense, especially things like righteous anger. Um, you can feel very justified in something. And so one has to be careful to take a look and make sure that you're acting from not a place of passion. And so I try to do a self check at first and see how, um, whether I can get my anger under control and simply not act regardless of whether it's the right thing to do or not, until that is roughly under control, at least in the moment. Um, so um, in terms of the actual technique that was used here, so some of the things that, were, uh, that you came up with um, didn't necessarily work. And that's an important thing to kind of put in your back pocket. And I would kind of take a look at the pattern of what the what things I put forth that um, that were said and see why they don't necessarily fit. So some of the values that you came up with were um, that he believes he's better than us. Well, why should that make me feel better if he's not better than us? Um, and I could see why that wouldn't quell anger. Um, that respect is important and um, power at, at any cost. Those are all aspects of intentional cruelty, it sounds like, and power hunger. And I could see, and it's very understandable, why hypothesizing those values held by him are not necessarily going to quell anger. Because if you have a cruel, power-hungry guy, um, part of the belief of anger, and that's driving the passion forward, is like, I should 
punish or get at people who are trying to screw over their other people. That kind of stuff is going to bring up anger and that it's appropriate to feel angry about this. Well, a lot of people do hold that it is appropriate to feel angry about injustice. And so I could see why these don't necessarily quell anger because they feed directly into another belief in that I should be angry at those who are unjust. So that would ask that if I were working with these, if I found myself wrote, writing these reasons down on a page, I'd say, okay, well, that's the core assumption here. That's clearly wrong. It's not speaking to my anger. So what is? And then I so I would do something similar to what you did in thinking about maybe there are other reasons that I'm not catching. Maybe it's not that he's cruel. What's the what's another hy hypothesis? Or maybe that he's not doesn't want power um, necessarily. Are there other hypotheses? And one is that maybe he had a bad upbringing, and that seemed to uh, dissipate anger. And so that's an important thing to kind of put in your back pocket that it's their situation that is. Uh, doing stuff. So this is actually something that's studied in psychology that's sometimes called the fundamental attribution error, that when something happens to us, um, we say, oh, it's the situation. It's not part of my character. When some other people do things, it's because of the inherent part of their character. That's an important bias to keep in your back pocket and try to focus more on situations in the future. When you feel annoyance and journal about it, focus on situations, not the character of the person. Maybe that's a better route for you to go. Um, now, going on to the second part of, and I also I would mention, like, it doesn't have to be as um, deep seated as maybe he was had a bad childhood. It could be something as simple as maybe he has a third, maybe his uh, family relative has a surgery. Maybe he's worried about the things that are happening in the Ukraine and lost some sleep over it. Maybe he just has trouble sleeping at night and he's cranky. That's a big one for me. Um, I just know that if I don't get enough sleep, I'm going to be cranky. And that's actually very hard to do. So actually, I do the stoic technique of trying to isolate myself from people I don't want to yell at when uh, I know I'm sleeping because I'm just not good enough to reliably, repeatedly catch me being cranky when I'm tired. So, um, so that's the first part of the question. For the second question about the doubts, um, was accepting his behavior and moving on wise or a lack of courage? So I don't know because I don't know what's in your mind. Um, I would say if I was looking for myself, um, the fact that I didn't get a handle on anger, I would say it's wise to not act in that case because the whole point of stoic practice and the whole point of getting rid of the passions or at least getting a good tamper on them to start with is so that you could act more wisely. If the anger is there and I see it, then I shouldn't act regardless. It's not a question of courage. It's actually kind of a, a question of wisdom, knowing what's a good action and a bad action. And an action done out of anger is always a bad action, even if it has good outcomes in the stoic view. So I would have just stopped right there if I was still angry, ideally. Um, not always. Sometimes I will act anyway. But ideally, I would have stopped right there or tried to do that. Um, and in terms of whether the bully got away with it or not, um, that's also an incomplete question from a stoic ethical perspective, because ethics is a state of your character. I mean, ethos literally means character. Um, so um, if you're coming from a place of trying to help other people, then it would be fine. But there's also a, a aspect of what I brought up earlier, role ethics. What are your strengths and weaknesses and proclivities? And what's your power relations given the situation relative to other people? If um, I was in a position where I thought I could stand up to this guy because I was ready for it emotionally and I had some kind of access or ways to possibly influence the situation, then ideally I would. If I was angry, I wouldn't at all again because I'm not in that situation then. Um, so I would kind of counter the question and say it's not fully formed and one should think about one's state of mind as well as the outcomes when asking such questions. So in general, if somebody has uh, is suited for it and in a position to do something and can withstand the emotional um, stuff that can go on or work with it more than withstand, then yes, ideally they would try to change the situation unless also they thought like whatever I can think of that I could say or do will either have no effect or make the situation worse. Sometimes just directly confronting something will have, so people will have them double down. And so maybe you won't do anything out of, because you're like, I don't see any way to move forward here and get decent outcomes for everybody involved. But the main things to keep in mind are um, the well-being of everybody, as well as your own internal states and whether you could handle it. There's no one-size-fits-all question to whether somebody should stand up to something in a, any given time. Uh, stoicism is more nuanced than that. Wow. Can I say, wow, that was amazing. And what's really interesting is just that constant kind of paying attention to what works and what doesn't, keeping the stuff that works, and then just, you know, 
yeah that's 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 great all right thank you so much greg um Sophia, I'm going to put the other one, uh, the other scenario in the chat now, and I might hand that over to you to read for uh, Massimo. Yeah, that that's actually it, it came up in in our ongoing discussions in Slack, and that was brought up by Scott. Scott has been keeping up a daily meditation from Seneca, I think. That was so. Anyway, that came out, and then we we thought we arrived at the conundrum. So I thought I'm going to ask um, uh, Massimo. So from a discussion in the daily meditations channel, this conundrum between keeping my cool and acting in a noble way arose. So that's how Scott said it. If someone is yelling abuse at me on the train, I can laugh and brush it off being a story. But if they're yelling at someone else, is it my duty to step in and intervene? And I sort of rephrased it uh, in a sense. I may tend to ignore the abuser if I am the target, but am I justified in ignoring him or her if the target is someone else. So Scott said that if he would feel it his duty to intervene. Me, because I am generally very diffident and scared, I probably wouldn't. Although I would see it inside. So I would love to know what Massimo would do. Well, that's a good question. Uh, as usual, and I think as Greg has made clear in, in his answer, you know, the answer to these kind of scenarios is it depends. So uh, one thing that doesn't depend, shouldn't depend on is, however, uh, whether you feel comfortable intervening or not. It has nothing to do with your comfort. Uh, if you're not comfortable uh, and you think, nevertheless, that you should intervene, you should summon the courage. That's one of the four cardinal virtues, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm not going to blame you if you don't, because there are plenty of situations where we don't want to be confrontation, we don't feel comfortable, et cetera, and we cannot overcome that discomfort. But if you're asking, what should I do? I, I think that your decision whether to intervene or not should not depend on whether you are uncomfortable or not. It should depend on, on whether it is useful for you to intervene or not in this particular situation. Now, so let's take a couple of extremes just, just to uh, uh, you know, think about it a little more carefully. If you see that somebody's getting close to or even has started to become physically abusive, then I would say yes. You should intervene. You should try, in fact, to help, to try to gather help from other people. So if you're on a train, call the train conductor, whatever it is that it's possible, because physical harm is, is the kind of thing that, yes, if, if you can, you should intervene. If we're talking about, on the other hand, just being you know, verbally abusive, then that depends on who the other person is. Um, and and the pen also depends on uh, whether, for instance, they can take care of, of it themselves or not. Right. I mean, it's it's and that could be a snap judgment on your on your part. It also depends on whether you think intervening is going to actually make things better or not. Are you actually, you know, screening somebody from harm or are you actually escalating the situation uh, mm -hmm. so that it gets it gets even worse? And unfortunately, there is no universal answer uh, to it. Right. It, it's part part of practical wisdom. The the. Uh, the virtue of practical wisdom, which is kind of a mouthful, I hate, I don't like that that term. I prefer the original, the early term, which was prudence. Unfortunately, prudence in English, in modern English today, means something you know, being tentative and you know, and all that sort of stuff. That's how prudence originally was about. Prudence meant to be able to figure out how, whether and how to intervene in a situation, how to handle a complex situation. So the 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 virtue of practical wisdom is crucial precisely for that reason. And there's no universal rule on how to use it, right? Or how to deploy it. It's a matter of, um, you know, experience, life experience and, and uh, thinking about your own actions. That's why the journaling actually after these events comes up uh, and mm -hmm. becoming, becomes important. I mean, I've been through situations in my life where uh, I probably should have intervened and did not. And what helped, what mm -hmm. happened uh, since I started doing my stoic practice is that then in the evening, I went back to my diary and I said, okay, so let's figure out here what did happen and what could you have mm -hmm. done better the next time around? And that question, what could I've done, what could I do better the next time around is actually important because 
that kind of situation might very well happen again, if, especially if the situation is one at work, for instance, or in an environment, you know, mm-hmm. kind of environment or with family, in a kind of environment that you normally frequent on a regular basis. And especially if uh, the actors uh, in, in, in question are actually people that you know, then you're almost guaranteed that that situation is going to repeat itself. But even if it is on a train with a stranger, you know, that if you take enough trains, it will happen again. Or if mm-hmm. you if you go enough to a public place, or you know, uh, it, it will happen again. So, don't necessarily think of of it as a failure if you do not intervene and you think that you should have, because that actually is a good good um, uh, reason to reflect on it, and and more importantly, for you to make a plan for the next time and say, okay, so if something like this happens again, what am I going to do about it? Um, so I'm afraid I don't, I can't really give you a sort of, again, again, a general answer that is applicable to all sorts of situations. Um, I know people get, get frustrated when, when they hear that in virtual ethics, not just stoicism, but virtual ethics in general, the answer is always, it depends. Mm. Uh, but it's not an evasive answer. Is it, the, the, the notion is, well, you should be thinking about depending on what. What are the parameters? What are the situations here? Who are the actors? Uh, the very same situation may or may not require uh, intervention on your part, depending on who the actors are, depending on exactly what's, what's, what is going on. More often than not, however, in my experience, uh, intervention is not a good thing because it has, because you're in the spur of the moment, you tend to be angry or upset about what's going on, you probably don't have a good handle of your of your anger in that kind and in the, in the specific situation, and so you're very likely you're very likely to escalate it rather mm-hmm. than than diffuse it. However, that should not be taken as a general rule mm-hmm. because, as I said, there are situations where you absolutely have to intervene, even though you might not think that you have the situation completely under control. It is uh, hard enough. It is it, on the other person, on the person who's been abused, that you really need to intervene. Now, the intervention might simply be not to confront the person that is being abusive, but to shield the one that is being abused, mm-hmm. and, and say, for instance, you know, uh, extend a, a hand and, and say, "Hey, would you like to go for a walk, or mm-hmm. let me buy you a cup of coffee, or something, something like that," in order to diffuse the situation instead of, of you know, putting yourself there mm-hmm. as a shield and then taking the blows. Mm, I think that was a great answer. Thank you. You know what was very, very useful? (laughs) Your answer actually highlights the importance of opening up that space, you know, in your journaling. You know, even at the moment, because as you say, situations like that happen so quickly and the space is not there to think, you know, what do I feel? What's the best thing to do? But when you do that while you journal then as you say that that is where the learning takes place when you mm. you know when you look at yeah that, that's great thank you that was really really good on things and i love the idea that there are no hard and fast mm. rules like some other kind yeah. of ethical frameworks yes. yeah. it just takes this constant um reflection and consideration and you have to keep coming back to it and and being out in the world and learning um i just love that it sounds hard but it's probably easier than the other way to do it. All right, everyone, we have so many questions coming in and some of you may be disappointed that we don't get to them, but let's just like zoom through them as best we can um, and see how we go. Jerry Everard, you're up next. I'm going to paste your question in the chat box and um, invite you to the microphone to ask your question. Good morning, Australia. Okay. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Sorry. I'll, I'll, I, if I am a bit tired, it is. Uh, it is fairly late. Um, okay. My question, I guess, relates to um, sort of considering the other person's perspective and the sort of helicopter view idea. Um, both are kind of seem to be a useful way to sort of move from a, a, an emotional response into an analytical one. Um, but I guess um, I, I sort of wonder, is, is it just a distraction from the emotion uh, or is it actually kind of um, a way to really uh, step back and put things into that sort of perspective? Um, so I, I, I guess that's the, the kind of quick part of it. Um, it also sort of 
I related to it through, um, you know, appropriate assertiveness training uh, in management. Uh, when you know dealing with an angry customer, um, how do you do that? Well, first you acknowledge the emotion uh, and acknowledge that the other person is angry, and then we can start to get to how how we can get future focused about the solution. Um, so I, yeah, I guess I'll I'll leave my my, my question there. Greg, you want to go first? Sure. I would say ultimately, it's an empirical question, what works and what doesn't. We just simply don't know enough about stoicism. Well, we don't know enough about a lot of things in order to say whether this is really a distraction technique or not. Um, ideally, we could run a trial where somebody is given a validated distraction technique, like counting the alphabet backwards versus doing this and seeing whether there are differences, both in the short term and long term. And if I were to get funding and actually have the skill to run the trial, I would probably also take a look at... Um, long-term effects. I, I, I suspect part of it is due to distraction, but also I suspect that if you take broader views or go into the other person's head, you'll decrease the anger that comes up more over time because you, um, you're you diffusing some of the fundamental propositional assumptions of anger. Remember from the story point of view, anger is that comes up when you feel justified in getting at somebody because they did something you don't like or that's unjust or whatever. That's the underlying assumption. I think by taking a broader perspective and seeing how small it is or taking the other person's perspective and seeing that they're not necessarily trying to do evil, that can help over time. And that's what I would predict if I were to run the trial, but ultimately it's an empirical question. Yeah, I would agree with Greg. It is certainly ultimately an empirical question. My hunch is, however, that no, this isn't about, at least in, in, in the intentions of the Stoics, it's not about distracting yourself from the emotion. It is about re reacting in a way that is more rational. I mean, let's not forget that the Stoics divide these, that their emotions into these two broad categories, right? Unhealthy and healthy. And the definition of an unhealthy emotion what makes an emotion unhealthy for the Stoics is that it interferes with, your, with and, and overcome, over, overtakes your reasoning abilities, right? So when they say that an emotion is in agreement with nature, it means that that emotion is in agreement with reason. And when they say that it's not in agreement with nature, it's, it goes against reason. So for instance, feeling joy for the right things is in agreement with reason. Feeling joy for the wrong things, it's not in agreement with reason. So if I feel joy because, you know, at, the, at looking and watching the suffering of other people, that's not in agreement with, with reason. And therefore, I should work on that because that's an unhealthy emotion. But if I feel joy at uh, some good outcomes for other people, some, something that, you know, uh, uh, justice being done, et cetera, et cetera, then that is actually something to cultivate. So the, the notion here is not necessarily to avoid the, the emotion. What it is, is to disengage with the emotion when it is about to take over your reasoning abilities, right? So Seneca's on anger, I think is still one of the best things ever written on anger, uh, even, you know, including much of modern, modern science. And he says very explicitly, you know, the first movement he divides anger into these three, three movements, right? The first movement of anger, when you feel like your physiological reaction, your, we would say your adrenaline is start pumping. There's nothing you can do about that. That is a uh, proto-emotion, basically. It's completely outside of your control. Just let it, let it do it. What it's telling you, however, is you pay attention. It's like, uh oh, something is making me angry. Then you have a small window, not to suppress your anger, because that's not going to work. In fact, Seneca says explicitly, don't even think about suppressing your anger, because it's not going to work. You're, you're going to lose that battle. But you have a small window when you can say, oh, crap, I'm getting angry. Time to disengage. Time to go for a walk. Time to retire to the bathroom and count until 20. You know, the, whatever it is that works for you or is doable given the situation. If you wait too long, you lost the battle. Now you're in full-fledged anger. Anger has overtaken your, your reason. And even though you may be angry for the right reasons, now you're probably going to do something that you regret. So the notion here is simply to try to train yourself to disengage from the unhealthy emotion as soon as you perceive it, as soon as you detect it, before it takes over and it starts guiding your behavior. Thank you. Okay, um, we've got a question from uh, Michelle. Okay. We've actually got about three or four questions. And everyone, I'm still working through the questions submitted.
submitted before um, the Zoom, so I'm not even um, at the point of looking at the chat questions, but have noted them all. So we've had a few questions on the emotions, and we're inviting Michelle Mansfield. Um, Michelle, I know that you're in the room, um, and we'd like you to ask your questions. So over to you. Sure. Um, so I was raised in a family. I know we've talked a lot about kind of extreme emotions like anger and joy, but there's a whole spectrum of human emotion, right? And um, I was raised in a family where showing emotion was really discouraged. So I've been working more on letting those emotions be expressed and really feeling them. But it doesn't always feel like I'm in control of when or where that happens. Um, so I'm trying to wrap my head around it and thinking that really the only thing I do control related to my emotions, and you've talked about this some in relation to anger, is what I do with that, what my actions are coming out of that emotion or as I'm going through that emotion. Could you just talk about that a little bit more, emotions in general and the stoic point of view? You want to take a first stab at it, Massimo? Sure. Um, yeah, you're right. So first of all, the, the stoics are clear that even the sage feels the same emotions as any other human being because the sage is a human being. <laughs> uh, and you know, there is no way that you're not going to feel the emotions. And in fact, both Seneca and, and Epictetus explicitly say, of course, you want to feel the emotions. You don't want to turn it into a stature. You, you don't want to turn it into something that is unfeeling, you know, cold and all that sort of stuff, uh, which takes, should take care right there of one of the stereotypes about stoicism, right? That it's all about the stiff upper lip and suppression of emotion. No, it's not. Mm. It's about managing your emotions and, in a sense, shifting your emotional spectrum from a way as much as possible from the unhealthy ones and toward a mindful cultivation of the healthy ones. But it's certainly not about turning into a state a stature. Now, in terms of showing your emotions, that is an interesting question. And again, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to start uh, sounding like a broken record, but the, the answer is it depends. Um, but there are a couple of, of things in Epictetus, for instance, that are specific and, and, and kind of interesting. At one point, somebody asked Epictetus, you know, so what am I going to do with this, my friend who is grieving for a loss? You know, what, what, how am I supposed to react to that? And Epictetus says, well, your friend is grieving because he's under the misconceived impression that he has actually, you know, that something bad has happened to him. While, of course, for the Stoics, even if you lose a loved one, nothing bad has happened to you, meaning that your character is not being uh, you know, affected. In fact, if anything, that's a test of your character. You can improve your character by the way in which you react to uh, setbacks and, and unpleasant situations. So he says, you know, your friend is under that, uh, from a stoic perspective, an, a misleading impression. But this isn't the time to tell him. You, you don't want to go to, the, to your friend and say, mm -hmm. oh, come on, you lost your wife. Come on. Have you not heard the Pictetus uh, and, you know, that, have you not heard that this is not affecting really your character, therefore you shouldn't be upset. That is not what he needs. That person right there needs comfort. And your, your first priority should be to comfort that person. And Pictetus goes so far as saying, if, by that, if that person expects you to, uh, you know, grieve with him and to cry or whatever it is, then you should do it for his own benefit. So long as you remind yourself inwardly that, mm -hmm. in fact, what has happened here is a natural thing that happens in life and it doesn't affect my character. Therefore, it is not a true, uh, be, truly bad thing for me. Seneca says something similar about anger. He says, at some, po some point, in order to get the results, you might need to show anger. But he says, make sure that you only pretend to be angry, as, if you, as you would do with a child, let's say. You know, sometimes a child is in the middle of a tantrum. He's not going to answer to reason. He's not going to do anything that you, know, that you would like him to do. So you show anger, but you don't feel anger. You don't actually, in, inside your inside interiorly, you do not actually let that emotion overcome your, res, your response. So according to the Stoics, there is a distinction between what you show and what you, man, you, what you try to, the way you try to react inwardly. Uh, they, do, they don't necessarily go uh, together because you want to retain a control over your actions, but at the same time, you also want to do whatever it is that is most effective to help people. Greg, what do you think? 
Mm, yeah, I agree with a lot of it. I would add to it a little bit that um, we have to be careful about what we mean by emotion, because it's a very mm, broad yeah. term, even in modern uh, neuroscience. Um, there's like, I think there was a survey done in the 80s about the scientific definitions of emotions, and the authors came up with over 100 of them. So emotions tough. So what do we mean by showing our emotions? Um, I could conceive of that in a lot of ways. One is just assertiveness. If somebody un hurts me in some way, I can either like lash out at them, which would kind of be a full blown passion, or I could say, you know, that kind of really hurt me or made me uncomfortable, um, which is more quelling the full passion, but still asserting what happened. Um, in that case, then that seems to be healthy as long as one has a basic handle on the passions and not acting from that place, then asserting boundaries and stuff can be very useful if that's what you mean showing your emotions are. If it means simple suppression, that probably leads to unhealthy things. And also Stoics tend to work with the underlying ideas behind emotions rather than um, rather than suppress them. And so that is probably not quite a stoic practice to fully suppress them. It's a small stoicism, a large stoicism. Right. And the final thing I would note about emotions or passion specifically in stoicism is, is that they have a strong behavioral component there. It's not just the feeling. Um, and so passions have a couple of characteristics to them. One is that they push reason to the side. And the second thing is that they're antisocial. They uh, they lash out at other people or put things before people. And that ap applies to both the negative emotions as well as the positive emotions um, or passions. So I would be just I would just urge a little carefulness about what one means about emotion when tackling questions like that. As to showing one's emotions, I think it can be healthy or unhealthy, depending on the details of how you're cashing out that word emotion. Thank you. Well, thanks for your question, Michelle. I hope that was helpful. I'm sure it was. All right, we're down to the last two questions, and they're big ones. So the pressure is on Marcimo and Gregory. Um, this one is from Scott Bennett, who couldn't be here today. Um, so I'll just read it out for him, and then I've got one more um, to come after this. So Scott is asking so stoicism particularly in its modern form it's in the chat box everyone um seems to focus mostly on the internal mental state of the practitioner keeping in mind what's up to us loving fate overcoming adversity and so on but the virtues are more outward facing than inward marcus in particular spends a lot of time reminding himself to see others as kin and work with them instead of against them so what are your thoughts um on you using stoicism to focus more on benefiting others in the cosmopolis, family, friends, etc., and less as a solipsistic self-help philosophy? Yeah, good question. I think that thinking of uh, stoicism as a solipsistic or inward looking and all that sort of stuff, it's a fundamental mistake. Uh, there really is nothing in Stoicism, to, to, in my mind, that suggests that interpretation. And so it, it, it really puzzles me when a lot of modern, uh, even some modern practitioners think of it that, that way, and certainly people who are external to Stoicism. Uh, first of all, uh, Marcus doesn't make that distinction between, uh, nor, nor should he, between his own internal inner states and how those inner states are going to affect other people because they are one and the same thing. It's the, if I think of, a, of people in a certain way, then I'm going to act in a certain way. And if I pe think of people in a different way, then I'm going to act in a different way. So the notion here is that, of course, you want to start by focusing, by asking yourself, well, how, how am I thinking about this, this thing? But the goal is always to improve the cosmopolis. It's never, there's no, there's no sharp distinction in, I think, in Stoic philosophy between me and the rest of the cosmopolis. This notion that, you know, I, if I do something for me, it's, it's selfish. And if I do something for others, it's altruistic. Uh, I don't think that distinction holds for the Stoics because I am a completely interconnected member of the cosmopolis. So if I do something for myself, which for the Stoics means improving my own character, I am automatically doing something that is making the cosmopolis better and if i help other people in whatever in whatever way not only i'm obviously making the cosmopolis better i'm making myself better because my own character is improving as a result of the fact that i am uh you know focused on on helping other people so that would be my basic take on it that there is a uh, it's really a fundamental misunderstanding of stoicism to think about it as a self-help 
in, in the sense self-help philosophy, in the sense in which we use self-help today. It's self-help if so long as you understand that there is really no sharp boundary between the self and the rest of the cosmopolis. Greg, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I agree that it's uh, it's fundamentally misunderstood. I've been on, I think I've said it a couple of times before that, I mean, I see how it got picked up that way. People put the dichotomy of control first and the dichotomy of control is feeling better. And so people tend to take it as a tool or a life hack to make themselves feel better, specifically by reducing negative emotions. They ignore the rest of Epictetus's philosophy, which is also quelling desires that make you feel good at points, as well as the other two disciplines, especially that of action, and that the only point of the discipline of desire is to clear the way so that you could act more wisely. So um, I may quibble slightly with something Scott said about um, it being the virtues being more outwardly facing. They are all framed or can be framed at points as terms of knowledge, which is a little bit of an internal state, but it's a knowledge of use of indifference to help the cosmopolis. So it's like a mix of both at the end. I wouldn't say that they're just outwardly facing or just inwardly facing. It's a mix of both. But as far as um, stoicism as self-help versus as a life philosophy for other people, yes. Um, if stoicism, if like I'd re stoicism as self help for I think is actually doing the world a little bit more harm than good. Um, if if it's all it is is a tool for building building resilience and it builds the resilience of assholes, then we're making the world having more resilient assholes. And um, if stoicism were to fade away versus um, make the world worse, I'd rather have it fade away. So I do my small part in trying to give it as a more coherent whole philosophy, but I am under no illusions that I can do much against the force of uh, Amazon putting a stoicism negative visualization booths on their factory floor soon and using it as a self-solve over um, a coherent life philosophy to try to make human beings better. All right, thank you both. Um, here's a final question. Um, and it's a hard one. It's you know relevant to what's happening in the world today. And uh, uh, I will ask Haneke to ask her question. Um, I think this question is really interesting because what do we do with the big horrific things that happen in the world? I mean, we're kind of better at in, in sort of working through dealing with people who might, you know, or, or with anger, but what do we do with the really big, heavy, horrific stuff? And uh, Haneke, I think your question, um, is great we will end on it it's a bit of a hard one but do you want to pop on the microphone and just add i'll put it also in the chat for you yeah. um hi hanneke hello um i i hope you can hear me yes yes perfect okay. uh well my english is not too well but um my question is well i'm very much uh well touched by uh what's happening nowadays uh with uh, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, I would like to know from both of you, or either one, uh, what um, would be the proper Stoic way to look at this war, which Putin has started uh, so aggressively. And um, well, I, I have a hard time to look at it from the perspective of Putin and to feel um, compassion with him about it. And uh, well, in the fourth week, we uh, have to look, uh, well, it, it is asked to look at the perspective of the other person. And I have a hard time uh, with it. I have a real hard time dealing with this situation, I, I find. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm actually curious to see what, uh, what Greg uh, is going to say about it. I can tell you my my take on this. I'm going off obviously through the same sort of emotional roller coaster and and, and looking at the at the situation as it's unfolding. Uh, first of all, compassion for uh, Putin. Yeah, that's difficult. That doesn't. That's not a good reason not to do it. <laughs> um, and so I can tell you a story. The, the Dalai Lama once was asked a similar question about Hitler. And, you know, somebody said, uh, you know, imagine that I had, uh, I had the, uh, the option to go back in time and uh, time, time machine and, and kill Hitler. Should, should I not do it with relish and, you know, with anger because, because I know what Hitler was going to do? And the, the Dalai Lama's response was, you absolutely should go back and kill Hitler. In fact, you should do it with, with some fanfare uh, to make because it's a big deal. However, no, you should do it not with anger, but with compassion because Hitler is a bad note in the karmic 
web and he did not ask to be there he just found itself himself there and uh it's not it's not it's something to be to be sorry about uh for him for him i say I think that that's a very good way of thinking about it. Uh, the Stoics don't talk about a karmic web, but they do talk about a, a web of cause and effect, and it's essentially the same thing. So I'm trying really hard. It's difficult, I grant you, but I'm trying really hard to feel compassion for uh, Putin in the sense of, you know, he didn't choose to be there. It's not, it's, 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 it's the result of just like everybody else of uh, cause and effect. Uh, that said, then the next question is, uh, what am I going to do about it? Because obviously I can't do much. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not like I have uh, a, a lot of sort of effective, you know, causal powers here. So what I decided that my role is going to be in, it has been in the last few days is, first of all, I try to inform myself in the best possible way. So I read a little bit about the history of the of the conflict, the why we got to this point. Uh, you know, uh, it's too easy to say there is bad guys and good guys over here. Yes, there's definitely a bad guy, but there is also not quite so good guys on the other side. I'm not talking about Ukraine. I'm talking about NATO and uh, and the U.S. who have made their own mistakes for their own political uh, purposes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That helps putting things in perspective. And then the only other thing I can reasonably do is to try to be helpful in some practical manner. So yesterday I went on the, the website of the um, International Rescue Committee, which is an organization that deals with uh, you know, displacement due to either natural disasters or wars. And I donated some money uh, because they already set up a refugee camp in, Polonia, in, in Poland to uh, you know, host refugees from uh, Ukraine. So I'm doing, you know, I donate, yesterday I donated the equivalent of taking care of eight families for a month or something like that. So you could, you can do these kind of things. You can also, of course, write to your representatives and senators and and say, hey, what are you, what are you guys actually doing about this thing? Uh, there is a tendency from a lot of American politicians just to not care just to distance themselves about about these sort of things so you could also do that and if there are demonstrations uh you know in front of let's say of the russian embassy i will go um that's small change it's not like you know i'm not going to be able to change the situation of course in the big, uh, big scheme of things although actually making a donation that makes possible for eight families to uh, and it's a small we're talking about a small amount of money we're not talking about huge huge money uh that actually does make a difference specifically for for people and so you're doing a little bit uh to make the cosmopolis better the rest you just have to accept that these are the kinds of events that are pretty much outside of your control and that it's it's good to focus on the little you can do, but then also to just say, this is definitely not the first time and it will not be the last time uh, that crap like this happens. I know that uh, Massimo has, has a hard stop and I have a, like a 20 minute more for my hard stop. So I'll try to be quick in mind. But in short, mm -hmm. I've stoicism has a kind of... Um, has shown me that sometimes the small actions are the things that I'm most suited for. And so, first of all, week one, the dichotomy of control is important if there are emotions that are coming up around this um, and thinking about how could you really actually change the situation. And a lot of the macro stuff at the end of the day, you specifically cannot. And so going and reach tweeting about it or something, unless you have a large Twitter following that can actually do something about it. There are some people where tweeting actually help. Um, I'm not one of those people. Um, so I kind of rule that out as a thing to do. Donations are a possibility, but I could give you a story recently. I've been following it for a little while now. Um, I have I am two degrees separated from people in the region, not I don't know anybody immediately from there. Um, but um, my partner actually is from a neighboring country, and she actually knows people who have family still trapped in the Ukraine. And she was actually found phone numbers um, for emergency evacuation services that she was trying to uh, post to uh, acqu acquaintances and work colleagues who had family trapped there. And so what I did in this situation is I got her tea and made her life easier because she was in a position to make a little more substantial change by sharing information with family to share with family there to try to get them out. And so I just take stuff off of her plate a little bit for 10, 20 minutes while she's texting. 
And sometimes that's what you could do. But honestly, that's the best. I was well situated in that circumstance to help somebody who knew somebody uh, to make their life a little easier for 10 minutes uh, and take some other like housework off their plate and stuff so they could go do it. And no grand gesture or anything. I'm not going to necessarily pick up an AK and fly to Ukraine and uh, help defend it or anything like that. Um, but um, in that case, that's the best I can do. And so stoicism really helps me focus on who and this role ethics thing that I was talking about earlier that really helped me focus on what I'm best situated to do and to do it. Um, in terms of the compassion aspect, I I understood where uh, to some degree, I understood the stated reasons Putin was doing the thing. I've been following it for a little while. Uh, one stoic practice I did was that my prediction was wrong in some degree. Um, I thought he actually wouldn't invade and I thought I understood the reasons. And one stoic thing I did is when I my prediction's wrong, I say what other assumptions um, that about the situation and in general was I wrong about? And then I try to change my mind. That's another stoic thing to keep your understanding of the world as accurate as you can possibly do it. And so when you're wrong, admit it and change your mind. Yeah. Those are two small things, but something I could do. Another another thing that I wanted to comment on on Greg because Greg pointed out so brought it up. So the, the use of social media is, is an interesting question. Unfortunately, I do think that we got into a culture where uh, a lot of people, not just about this issue, but a lot of people just think that, you know, I'm going to say, write 200 words, uh, 200 characters on Twitter, and I'm done. I, I've, I've done my part. You know, I feel so good because I'm done. That's nonsense. You're not doing anything. However, if you do have a large following, uh, then you can engage people in discussions. You can post resources. So, you know, in my case, my, my following on Twitter is not that large, but it is about 30,000 people. That's not nothing. And therefore, I have been judiciously occasionally using uh, my Twitter uh, reach for saying, hey, you guys know about this. You guys can contribute to, uh, to this. And that is, I think, a, a, another, again, it's a drop in the bucket. But uh, as Greg said, you know, all we can do is drop in the back it un un unless we actually command armies and we don't, mm. so. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Massimo and Gregory for joining us. Uh, we could obviously keep you here for days <laughs> um, <laughs> and hopefully we'll invite you back uh, maybe mid middle of the year and yeah, so we can see how we're all going. Uh, everyone, how about we all pop on the mic and just shout thank you. Um, <laughs> And uh, thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really good. Oh, thank you. Well, on that note, I'll let you both uh, go. And uh, yeah, thank you again so much. You've given us so many practical tips, and that's important for us as thank we you. continue yep. on our journey. And thank you for this. And uh, yeah, we'll chat again soon. Yeah.